<laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, so the backstory on this. Last February, we made an upgrade to the forklift. We put the Sidewinder swing carriage on. So now the forks can swivel 90 degrees to the left, 90 degrees to the right. However, they're connected by these two auxiliary uh, hydraulic ports that have no feathering ability. <laughs> so when you just tap the button, that's what happens. Anyway, that combined with the truss jib has made our life much simpler. Uh, the trick, by the way, if you want to feather that control is boom out or in. So you kind of split the pressure on the hydraulics. <laughs> ah, that is classic. That is classic. Ah, the joys of being a two-person crew. So while Kyle's in the forklift, that means I have to go back and forth. The little three-pound maul makes quick work of lining up the edge of that five and a half by 15 right at the corner of the plate. Uh, ignore what you're seeing here. There's a little bit of a mistake that we repaired. Uh, focus though on, we already have our strap installed on top of the wall, and then it will get nailed to the underside of the beam. Now you do get a load reduction with the CSHP installed in this way, but you just add a few extra inches, not a big deal. The SDWS timber screws is our preferred way of fastening because the little self-piloting bit on the end of those or tip, I guess self-piloting tip, it won't split out. Also, if I need to move it for any reason, I can. I'm gonna basically go up and down. Not that Kyle can hear me, but I still find that I'm speaking out loud while I'm signaling. Oh, gone it. <laughs> Just for the record, I identify at two inches taller. If at first you don't succeed. Kind of wish I would have had the three pound mall here. So toe screw again. Notice that the glue lamb that it's sitting on extends to the right inside the wall and then extends out. And that's to avoid a post right on the front porch. Edge. Here, I'll give you, I can help you. Here we frame our roof at 24 inches on center. So butting the exterior foam, in this case, the insulation, that's the corner of my building, 23 and a quarter, rafter long. I won't move my hand. Guys! Nice. Pulling layout evenly all the way through the back ensures that even though we're going to frame up and over that room in front of you with an overframed roof, all of the jacks will still land on two foot centers, making our roof sheathing easy. So that works out pretty good. One more thing to note, I have two studs nailed there at the corner. That's because we're using the Zip R6 panel, which is one inch poly ISO foam plus the 7 16 panel. So you need additional backing for your corner trim. Okay. So a big part of what's gonna take place in this video is all the walls are framed, we're plumb and lined, but we're gonna set all of the beams that either support the ceiling, the rafters, both, and then the ridge beams. So this beam was like a five and a half by 15, I think it was 22 or 23 feet long, that runs front to back. That's going to support the vaulted section 
as well as we're gonna land rafters on top of that. Again, it's kind of a challenge with just two people. So sometimes what we do, if Kyle can't see me, in this case he can, I can signal. With the tagline, I can move things around. You just know you're gonna do a little bit of up and down work to get it positioned just right. Although we are getting a lot better and with that trust jib, it is a huge improvement. Other times, we just call over our wireless Bluetooth earbuds. We like the IsoTunes free, the link is in the description. I am an ambassador for them, but I have a coupon code that'll save you 10%. They, they're just so easy to use, and then we can communicate uh, hands-free. So technically the bearing is to the right, and that's why you can see a bit of a gap. That's the camber from the glue lamp. I'm attaching it with strong tie SDWC. They're really made for trusses and blah, blah, blah. I think I have a video on my channel if you wanted to see that in more detail. But we fasten it with those because it's easy. They don't split. They have a ton of uplift okay, compared so to toenails and nails. Yeah, and if for any reason we need to move it, we can. They zip in a little quicker. Yeah. And I don't think comparing. Right. It's thinner and because it's fully threaded, that's why the head doesn't have to be so big. Nice. So. Yeah. Okay, let me ditch. I promise this is not an advertisement for Strong Tie, although they have sponsored some of my videos and I do enjoy working with them. All of our hardware happens to be Strong Tie. So in this case, it's a concealed hanger for a five and a half inch wide glue lamb across the kitchen that we're gonna pony wall up to and support our 24 foot rafters. So when they're high capacity hangers like this, I like to buy the ones that come with the SDS screws. Yes, they install a little bit slower, but again, again, you save a lot of time if you have to move it for any reason at all. And again, you get the higher capacity. It's a little easier on the body too. I don't have to go get a gun out. I tell you what, if you guys aren't using little impact drivers like this, they're really lightweight. Just roll one out and hide it in a wall cavity so you don't have to put it away. I, I know some guys that do that. But seriously, it just makes life easy. You don't have to run a hose, you're still without a cord, no hose, no extra gun. You get the point. By the way, a drill will install these faster, unless you speed up the video, but the impact gun is, uh, it's lighter weight, you're never gonna wrench your wrist. So there's a trade out there. We use the drill for like big screws, but generally speaking, we use these little impact. Now, of course, I did not get any footage installing this beam. It wasn't a big deal. And you'll notice, as I give Kyle the measurement, that we do not have a column in the wall cavity where this beam is going to sit. Let me explain that in just a moment. Okay, to the head of the screw, 170 and three quarters is pretty tight. Okay. On the weather. And I feel these are the eyes of disarray. Now, I'm so old that I had that Stone Temple Pilots album on CD when it came out. So, just saying. I grew up here west of Seattle, so we got to hear all that stuff. Of course, they were not from Seattle like Pearl Jam was. Anyway, who cares? So, same thing, SDWC screws. I'm gonna attach those through our double king stud and the cripple wall framing. We have our four, to, four by six panel edge backing. Remember from the previous video, we like four by six because it makes the wall stiff and it goes up. Notice that I can run a screw underneath. Of course, I, again, like I said, I did not get any video, but the beam sits on top of that. We frame in the column after, no toenailing. I just don't like the toenail glue lamps because they split. Here's again, that sidewinder carriage. You see a little bit better. I can rotate those forks 90 degrees to my left. That meant that I could drive around because we couldn't take that one tree down when we cleared the property. That's on the neighbor's property. We really wanted to. We were getting good at cutting. There it spins. This was our only access, by the way, to get around the house. Just enough room for the forklift. Thankfully, the little forklift's in the backyard. I know I've commented on this in previous videos, but pretty much since 2008, Kyle and I have been a two-person crew. Uh, at different times, we've had like a third person with us. 
The third person you saw in the previous videos decided to start his own business. So Shane, he'll come back and help us. But really, once he left, we shot some May the 4th Star Wars pictures, and that was his last day. But he'll come back to help us out, so you'll see him in future videos. But part of the way that we've been able to keep building homes with just a two-person aging crew, mind you, is because we have the two forklifts. The one I'm operating here, we bought back in 2003. There was extra capital investment incentives back then when the economy was a little slow and there was a tax plan passed here in the States. We bought it, and then in 2005, we bought the 1056 there in front that's got more of a reach. At that time, we had two framing crews going, two finished carpentry crews. We pioneer builders here, we had almost 20 employees. Shortly after that, starting in about 2006, is when the market started to slow down and people started to move on, just island. That's how you do it. This is how you do we <clears throat> this is how we do it. I got in, I was coming around the corner, I was like, I gotta put the hat on. Those beams I just brought around the back with the machines, that would have gone in place where the hangar was you just saw, as well as another beam in the back of the great room. All of those beams really support raft room ridges. Now in this case it's a five and a half by fifteen. Uh, one of them was 32 foot long, if I recall. I think that's this one. And then the other one was that, that extends the ridge was, I think, a 15 foot or 14 foot. Anyway, when we rig it, we find dead center and then we space it off so that the beam stays level. But the guy on the other end, with very little effort, he can raise and lower and pivot the beam. So Kyle's aiming it right for the beam pocket that's in our ray claw. So remember, when we frame those, we keep our top plates connected. Once it's up in place, then we cut it out so that we can drop our ridge beam right in. Pretty simple. Kyle just fastens it with a screw. Full disclosure, <laughs> as easy as that looked, I had the height wrong for that ridge. So we had to make a small adjustment to the post. Now, we just use one of these big timber screws to just raise that beam with that little impact driver. We add our piece a half inch, and now we have a consistent air gap all the way across. I don't, I don't know what I did wrong. I probably just inched it, but I do that a lot. Okay, so this takes us about a day to get ceiling joists and beams in. And basically, I consider that prep to actually start cutting rafters and framing them. What I like about this plan is notice here along the bottom. We have our single bay garage on the left. We have a five and a half by 15 that runs from left to right across the porch and it's strapped to all of the walls. So that essentially connects, well, it literally connects that single bay garage shear walls to then the front bedroom shear walls. And then we have a single LVL that goes from that wall all the way to the rake wall at the bottom, again, all connected. So we have a nice continuous load path across the bottom of that house. Going north to south from the garage, we have our eight foot garage wall. We have a beam strapped and connected that runs all the way to that rake wall. That's kind of, I call it a half rake wall. Again, same thing. So now all of those shear walls are connected. After that's done and we seal and joist, then we have the beam that I mentioned earlier there at the top right, right in the middle. That's what goes across the kitchen and will uh, support the 24 foot rafters. You can see, of course, the main ridge beam and then the vaulted great room at the top middle. There's our ridge beam set. It lands on a beam that connects. All of those beam, po uh, all of those beam point loads then trace down to the footings that you saw when we did the footings, the walls, and then framed the floor. Kyle was off for the day and everything was too heavy for me to do, so I framed the master bedroom ceiling. We call this a hip tray, easy one person work. All of the components, the, the rafters, the hips, those are all pre-cut on the ground out of just two by four and then measure to fit in the upper part of the ceiling. I, I, normally we would wait for dry work or undercover to do this, but it was easy for me to do. And it did give us a nice spot to balance our big two by 12, 24 foot rafters. Plenty strong enough. Now it's all coming together. Besides all the beams that we set, you can see how the rake walls all fit together, how the load pass are traced with the beams. We even got our rafters cut. So we're gonna get into that in the next video, how we went about cutting them. I've got some time-lapse footage of that. 
We're gonna start stacking the big rafters, the great room, etc. Thank you guys very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. It, uh, it fr honestly, it keeps work fun for me. So there it is. All the ceiling joists are in, all the beams are in, we're cleaned up. We are ready to start stacking that roof. Please hit the like and subscribe button. I will love you forever, even though we've never met. Thank you, everybody. Finally, we are ready to cut some rafters and frame this roof. And we were... 10 inches. Or you can go 10 and 1. 1 was 10 and 2, 1 was 10. So... King of Wishful. Question, do I want to keep any of this for scab and tails? How much is it? Well. Oh yeah, to kind of do, do a tail. Oh, you know what? I, can we get that? No, we can't, because now we got to go off of the foam. That's not a bad idea to have this. I, I think, think that's easier. So the 24 foot rafters did not give us quite enough tail because we have to go an inch and a half past the plates because of the foam sheathing that we're using and we have 16 inch overhangs. Okay, young guys, don't let the scrap hit the ground. That'll save you time bending over. Think about it, if you have to do this a billion times, you just saved yourself a billion times bending over. So the back is 14 and the front is five. 19? 19. I think it was 20 for some reason. There was one extra. Okay, you want to do 20? Yeah, let's do 20. So for the main roof, we had quite a few different sections. We had sections that landed on plates. So that's the ones we're cutting here. Then we had sections that hangered into a, that five and a half by 15 garage glue lamp. And then we had a section that landed into hangers on an inch and three quarter by whatever it was, 14. So that's why we did these in stages. And we went ahead and set up three pairs of our jackass sawhorses so that we could roll out, I don't know how many it was, maybe 10 at a time, cut them, stack them, kind of clean up as we go, and just stay as organized as possible. This was 32, 24 foot, two by 12, kiln dried Doug fur. It was a love tap. Crown everything toward the garage? Yeah. I like to alternate crowns, and that way it averages out the problem. Clear. Now, I hate to speak over this riveting audio, but because we were blasting a 90s classics playlist, Spice Girls just came on, and I don't want to get flagged for copyright issues. Now, to minimize packing 2x12, 24 foot Doug fur. We just keep that unit. I ask for them double stickered and separate so we can snag them with the forklift. We raise them about the height of the sawhorses. We're already gonna rotate them and flop them. We want all the crowns toward the garage and we're gonna call out anything that's really ugly. We're gonna set those aside, use them for something else. I always order a few more than I need for exactly that reason. Now it's just time to get into a rhythm. If we do a good job on the culling, by the way, then that roof is nice and flat. And when that low angle sun hits it, you're not gonna see anything ugly. That's the goal. Gotta get with my friends. Now, since I have the bird's mouth on my side, I'm just gonna go ahead and flush up the end of the rafter, flush up the top of the rafter, and then go ahead and scribe. Sometimes the rafters, now we're really fortunate here in the Pacific Northwest. These two by 12s are all gonna be 11 and a quarter. Sometimes they're 11 and an eighth, sometimes they're 11 and three eighths. Not a big deal. Whereas sometimes material could be 11 or 11 and a half. As long as the tops are flat, the roof's gonna be nice and flat. We don't care about the underside because all of that's going to be in the attic. So that's how you do it. Now, sometimes the opposite is the case. 
where you might have a big cathedral ceiling, in which case you would flush the bottoms so that the drywall looks flatter. And you might be able to hide some more at the top. So coal, coal your material, and then all of this is a lot easier. Gasp! Can you believe I overcut? Yes, I always overcut my rafters just enough that the scrap comes out. I'm not going to use a handsaw. That is a waste of time, in my opinion. As far as overcutting, some of you might want to finish your rafters with a handsaw. Go for it. I am not one of those people because I've proved to myself that I don't need to. Take a rafter, maybe cut a three foot tail, overcut it so the scrap falls out. Take that rafter, screw it to a wall. So the tail's about a foot off the ground. Now go stand on the end, balance and bounce on it. You're not even gonna hear that tail crackle. It, it really is quite amazing and I do recommend doing that. I've done that and posted it on Instagram. You can go check it out if you'd like or just do it yourself. It is pretty eye-opening. So I think I looked it up. Uh, dry two by six is like two pounds per foot. So that would mean this is about four pounds per foot. Yeah. So, 96 pounds of board. Yeah. Round it up to 100 to sound cool. Yeah, I, I believe it. I remember packing some, we were cutting around the street and then had to pack them around the back in McCormick. But across from Gehrings, it was a house we had done like back in 2001. Yeah. I really thought I was going to die because then you had to lean them through the window and I, I was giving serious thought to, I don't think I can do this for the rest of my life. Yeah. And here I am, Kyle, 20 years later. All right. Uh, on the ground? I don't know. Because these two are going to go away on the next batch. Sure. Yeah. Want to start new stack? Sure. Here, let's do this. Just slide them out, and then we'll walk less far. Someday somebody's going to turn around and make you cry. Going to and make you cry. Don't you know? Don't you know? Things will go your way. Oh, yeah, baby. Don't you wonder if Hazzy even thinks about us anymore? Hazzy? Oh, Hazzy. Okay, Timmy's got to go potty. Okay. Um, yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll turn off the camera. So I looked it up. We started using these Makita saws in April of 2017. Like we've tried cordless saws, but once we, in fact, so I got one for a review for the Journal of Light Construction. And within a day, I promptly ordered another one online. Since then, we've added a couple more. It's a little underpowered compared to some of the other saws, but it's just fine and it's a lot lighter. I just have nothing good, nothing but good to say about these Makita saws, really all of the cordless. I reviewed them all for Journal of Light Construction, compared them but I really like that Makita. So take that for what it's worth. I, I, can't, I can't believe that we're cutting two by 12 rafters with bird's mouth. We don't ever overheat the saws. Yeah, we'll swap batteries out, but like we're doing this all cordless now. I wish I wasn't getting this old. It's just, it's just getting easy.
On to another batch. This one doesn't have tails. Like I mentioned, and I think you'll be able to see it a little bit later in the video. Since we had those glue lambs and other beams to carry the rafters, we end up just hangering those rafters. Uh, hanger, by the way, is a noun, not a verb. <laughs> we set the rafters into joist hangers. Let's put it that way. And so that's why you don't see a tail, but it'll be plum cut, plum cut, and then a C cut for the hanger. That pile of scrap that is growing at my feet, is that just wasted wood? No. Hang on for just a few minutes. We're able to use up almost all of that. And I'll show you how, and I'll try to explain why we do this. So you can see that basically when we're in cutting mode, let's just stay in cutting mode. It's just more efficient. And, and when you get used to the particular task, you just get a little faster and a little smoother. So instead of cutting a set, going and stacking it to get it out of the way up on the roof, just get them all cut. And therein lies the beauty of knowing how to figure out your rafter lengths. So we'll, we'll get, come back to that in a future video. I'll try to find the right plan and, and really detail that out. It's not difficult. Now, I will say this, we often cheat. We've already built our rake walls. So instead of doing the math again, we're actually gonna just measure the rake wall. And that's one way. Let's just say that you did make a slight mistake in your rake wall. You can fix it easily by just changing the rafter length somewhat. So don't tell anybody, but we don't do everything perfectly. Notice too that Kyle and I work kind of opposites. And that way we're not moving the same board that the other guy's cutting. It's just a safety thing, right? You don't want to yank on the board while he's in the middle of a cut. One thing to notice, right where I was just cleaning up scrap, we have a pile of blocks that are cut 22 and 7 16 So as we're cutting rafters, knowing that we have extra length, we cut those 22 and 7 16 Those are mostly going to become our bird blocks. But in some cases, we're gonna rip them in half with a bevel and they're gonna become our blocking at the top of the rafter at the ridge. That's gonna be our boundary nailing for our roof sheathing. And it also acts like a little bit of a pressure block. So anyway, we'll come back to that. You'll see how that all works. But essentially, we're cutting our blocks at the same time that we're cutting our rafters. And again, it's just one of those things that helps you to save a step. Oh, you just measured the top plates? Yeah. Man, well, that was smart. Okay, I'm gonna warn you, oh, I'm trying to put some music underlying the next clip, because I don't oh, want to get flagged for copyright, but at the same time, those okay. of you that know, you'll know. Shane, anyway, I, I, I hope you. that this works. Shane would just like listen to all of his music, like at night. I still remember that music video. This is a Phil Collins, isn't it? Yeah. It didn't sound like him at first. I know the song, but I'm just like, I didn't know who was saying this song. Is the way that I walk. So are we getting enough out of the 16s? I don't know. I think we are. Yeah, 16. All right, let's try this for the gram. First, first try. Nah. Yeah, let me get it. <laughs> oh yeah, dude, we have tons of tails. 139.2. Or tons of uh, I love, I love tail. 
I would rather have six foot overhangs and skip the rain screen. Get it? Right. And ten, yeah, ten, yeah, ten inches works. Ten and two, ten inches, whatever. Maybe leave the line. Don't tell me what to do. Like if you tell me to wear a seatbelt, I won't, because I'm an American and I have rights. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm an individual. And uh, you know, I got to this way of thinking by all those things people said. Yep. Okay, 16 and 12 off framing because that's regular, minus inch and a half. Is that Kylie? I couldn't tell you. Oh, there it is on the top. Did you know that Kylie and Michael Hutchins were an item? Who's Michael Hutchins? The is singer Fran Excess. Fran Excess, yeah. Well, sorry. Here, why don't you make yourself useful? Why don't I do this? Why don't I? Oh. Do you want me to do, uh. Want me to cut those? Yeah. I mean, I could have cut them on my side. That would have been smart. Is that my marker? Mine. Uh oh. Can't find mine. It looks a lot like that one. No, I've had these in my bags for a long time. Very long time. How much? Okay, we already got blocks. We already got blocks, bruh. How much do you think? Ah, hang on. I don't know, 50%? Do you think it would take for you to pay Nikki to go to a nightclub dancing? Like a legit nightclub, like in Seattle. Are there such things? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Name one. Pink. So it's not legitimate. Oh, it's absolutely legitimate. Like it is a 100% nightclub. So they didn't actually let me in the door because I was wearing this like old navy jacket that kind of looked windbreaker ish what um they had a dress code like where it was like, oh like and, mcdonald's and then it was like there was a line out the door what actually is a nightclub it's a bar and dancing well every bar is a dance no but it's not where just like there's where you go to a bar and there's like a few tables it's like a nightclub with the lights and the dj and a huge dance floor and the bar in the background. Like you'd see on Zoolander? Basically like, yeah, all the club, any, any club you've ever seen in like I don't think, an actual club. I don't think I could pay her to do that. Man, not even a billion dollars. Well, uh, everybody will do anything for a billion dollars. I'm just saying, what's your price, man? I don't think I'd have to pay Katie. <laughs> it's all the hip hop classes? Yeah. It's like art. It's art to get that entire cutoff in one piece. Now there's less cleanup to do. But again, we're not done. We're going to use up that scrap. Okay, so we like to run our bird blocks vertically, not square to the tail. We use closed soffits, so it doesn't matter. But our engineer prefers 
Well, let's put it this way. We can avoid hardware if we put in vertical bird blocks. So we get the little cordless table saw out and we buzz them all through at the heel stand with the angle. Then we're gonna notch those for venting. What this does is it allows us to save an A35 or an RBC clip. Our engineer says, just make sure that block has got three toenails into the plate. Then we're gonna nail our roof sheathing into that block and that transfers the, the roof loads, uh, the, specifically the roof diaphragm load, down through the blocking into the shear walls, all the way down to the foundation. I'm not surprised. It's a lot of ripping. Yeah. Oh, oh you already hated it. Yeah. Interesting. I was gonna try to get through that whole pile without. I'm trying not to push it too hard. Yeah. It didn't sound like you were pushing it, but you know, it's pretty thick material. This is the little, I believe it's an eight and a quarter inch cordless Milwaukee table saw. Uh, I've, since then I've put in a Diablo blade and it does rip a whole lot better. Uh, I should have done that to begin with, but it did okay. Just overheated the battery, right? I think that this thing works really well, even on a 22 and a half degree bevel, because it's a 512. The writhing knife keeps it from binding and the little anti-kickback just does such a great job. And even the guard popped up like that does a good job. So yeah, guards can be a hassle, but I, I've just been like 99% really impressed with the guard. Uh, that 1% irritation is just the price of safety. So now we're cutting all these blocks in half so that out of each of those two by 12 by 22 and 7 16 I'm gonna get two blocks at the ridge. Okay, so keep track of that. And it's totally worth beveling. It's like, I don't know how many blocks, but it runs through pretty quickly. Now, here's the quickest way to cut notches. Our blocks are beveled, making it easy to set. You'll see that in a little bit. We have to nail our roof sheathing into these blocks, but we also still need to allow venting through the ridge vent. So I'm cutting a one and a half inch deep notch by six inches. So I go ahead and I center that on this first batch. Make one cut, cross cut on each side, and then I'm gonna go with the loose base plate and I just plunge. And all I have to do is line up between the two depth marks. Nice and easy, see, clean cut. This is the fastest way I found to do it. We used to notch them and then beat out and then you have blocks everywhere, it's just stupid. So we're using up all that scrap, cutting it down to 22 and 7 16 I make one scribe at the top, make sure they're nice and square. Again, this Makita saw is cut and square. You know what that means? It doesn't mean that Makita is the best. It means that we don't abuse our tools. So now what I'm gonna do is just cut my way through the stack. This is a little bit lighter than using a beam saw. I'll just cut, I'm basically cutting two boards at a time, not fully but the cut on the underside, it just transfers all the way down. The other thing worth noting is that compared to a worm drive saw, these saws do not have as much torque. They also have an electron electronic brake. 
Electric brake? Same thing? I don't know, who cares? They have a brake, so as soon as you let your finger off the trigger, the blade dies. It is going to be very difficult to get the saw to kick back. Using it the way I'm using it, there's just not enough torque. Um, well, you see, it's recording. Okay. How do you have me now? Because I can see the camera. Next time, tell me my hat's off center. It's always off center. Yeah, it's like, like what? every every straw hat you wear, it ends up getting. Well, I think even baseball cap. I look in the mirror and I'm like, why am I crooked? Oh, maybe, maybe you don't have the Denzel face you thought you did. No. Okay, so it's in my hand. This is how I always do it. Okay. Slightly crooked. Yeah. It must be that I kind of curve. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, you curved the bullet? <laughs> oh, hey, Instagram. Uh, somebody forgot to subtract five and a half because of the beam. But if you're going to make mistakes, fix them quickly. It's the Martinez, what do we call uh, Stair gauges? It's the Martinez stair gauges. Rule number nine of Austin Framers is when you make a mistake, fix, fix it. it really fast. <laughs> Rule number 10 is don't make mistakes. <laughs> now that the rafters are cut correctly, we're gonna go ahead and stack the living room roof. Once that's all stacked and blocked, all that good stuff, we're gonna sheet it. And that way the overframe can land on top of it and we can get all the big rafters up. Like technically, I'm gonna make it work. Yeah, you go ahead and nail yours. Cool, and then I'll adjust this to an inch air gap. Yeah, I'm off by the nail heads. I really don't care. Okay. It's probably 316. Cool. That might give us some flop as we go. Yeah. This one looks pretty good. Yeah. So again, because we have to have blocking at the ridge and then there at the beam, that's where we're gonna use up some of those beveled blocks with the notches and then some beveled blocks. Kind of act like pressure blocks. We'll add some hangers later, but that way we have full boundary nailing on all the roof sheathing. You might be thinking to yourself, why did we only stack the one side? Because it just doesn't matter. We had a nice straight ridge beam. Once that side was locked in, also notice that the left-hand side, there's a two by four wall that the rafters are gonna land on. So if we make them perfect on the beam side, ridge beam to the beam that's carrying that roof, which I think was a five and a half by 15, that's all gonna be locked in. If these overhang a little bit, it really doesn't matter because it hides in the attic. Yeah, that's lovable. Okay, so that's five feet. I'll go a half. Okay. And this one. Okay. Okay, the next one actually. Okay. <sighs> All right, I am good there. Okay, tell me when you're good. I'm good. You don't 
finish with a handsaw. Oh no, that's very, that's quick thought. It. Well, is that a Britney Spears song? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I can live with it. Okay, I'm trying to give you an extra eight. So the reason that we notched that rafter is because we have a six by six that's carrying a couple of ceiling joists sitting on top of the walls. So instead of trying to do any math, it's easier, as you saw, just to scribe and fit. At this point, I can hand up to Kyle because these rafters are pretty short. So they're two by 12 for insulation, not for the span or for structural reasons. Uh, easily, we could have done two by eight for the span, but we need it for insulation. So Kyle's installing the blocks at the ridge as he goes. Now you can see the little vent notch. That's gonna allow airflow to come up and out. We ended up drilling some holes in the roof sheathing to allow the attic air to get up there. You're getting a taste of springtime in the Pacific Northwest. It's cloudy and drizzly, and then the sun comes out. And then it's cloudy and drizzly, and the sun comes out. So it makes it really hard if you're wearing rain gear. It ends up, you feel like a greenhouse. As soon as the sun comes out, you strip it off. So honestly, you kind of just learn to just get wet and not worry about it. Now we can stack the big long rafters. And these bad boys are heavy and as I get older, my elbows start to bother me. So I'm the guy at the ridge this time. Over the years, I've always kind of preferred to be the guy that lifted in the rafters and put the new guys at the ridge, taught them how to do that. One, because when I was younger, that was my job and I just learned how to do it well and I can control it. Um, young guys, they need just a little bit of experience because otherwise they let pressure off the rafter when you go to nail. Anyway, it just allows me to kind of keep my eye on things too. But modesty hopefully will help me to stay framing for a few more years because I really enjoy framing, but I do not enjoy lifting big, heavy 24 foot two by 12 rafters. So I'm gonna show at the end of this video how all of the uh, air notching goes. Some of you might be wondering, how come we're not putting our rafters on top of the ridge? And we certainly could, and there's nothing wrong with that. I guess my answer is, What's the advantage? In this case, we don't need to worry about insulation, but if you land the rafters on top of the ridge, you really should insulate those cavities. So we find that we just butt them. The engineer's okay with that. We um, spec these blocks at the top. He's okay with that. We got our venting. And then later we're gonna add collar ties once it's all framed. Here are those collar ties. Just two by fours up under the ridge, five nails per side. There's a great fine home building article on collar ties versus rafter ties. Collar ties are in the upper third, and you can look it up in the code table in the International Residential Code. Basically what this does is as wind hits one side of the roof, it creates lift on the other side, which can open it like a clamshell. Now, that is impossible. So that's gonna be a two by four underneath the ridge that locks it all together. So, super, super strong. I, I guess I just don't see an advantage of lowering the ridge. But we've done it and we'll do it if the plans call for it. Have you ever watched news radio? Uh, From the 90s with Dave Foley and no, never did. Phil Hartman was on it. No. Joe Rogan, young Joe Rogan. Oh, wow. It's actually really funny. I was kind of wondering where like Joe Rogan came from. Yeah, I found it on, um, it's like on Crackle or something, yeah. which means you have to watch it with commercials, which is right. pretty lame. Commercials, what is this, the 90s?
Okay, we're gonna fight this one because obviously that is a gnarly looking rafter. Yeah. So I might have you cut this block because I think it's so cupped. Nice. Oh, Did you see that? Oh, brother. Hey, brother. That's probably what, like a quota? Yeah. Australian or British? Um, I think Australian. But you have to live. Okay, you have to live. You, you have to live where you're from. Yeah, Australian. Okay. That's a that's a no-brainer. Do you know they have the most poisonous animals on the planet? There. I doubt it. I mean, you could die if you were swimming in the ocean. What then? I think you'd have to remarry. Yeah, but she'd marry an Australian guy. That sounds like a win-win, really. I would be dead, and she'd have a sweet accent. Do you think she'd go taller or shorter? She'd probably want to try tall. It's very awkward to walk down the street holding hands. It's, unless the guy does yoga, it's really not all it's cracked up to be. I used to just grip these, thinking that I, it's just like, oh my goodness. And now, it's like, I barely put fresh upward pressure on it. it. It really is true, yeah. Oh, don't look at that. Now it's time for the overframing. Becomes a little more clear how the roof fits together. So. 2 by 12 jacks over the top. Again, we just keep all the rafters the same length, even though we could, or uh, same species. Same species, it's all dug fur. What am I even saying? We're keeping them all the same dimension, two by 12. Now make sure that you have a sleeper that is big enough to support the heel of the rafter. The other side, we had it perfectly, not this side, so we had to add another two by four strip under the heel. Cause you know, we're idiots. So Kyle's just eyeballing spacing with his tape measure. Uh, we don't trust his eyeball. <laughs> so obviously, remember earlier in, I think the last video, when we pulled layout across the back plates. Now you can see why we did that. That way two foot on center stays all the way through. When we sheet up and around these valleys, then we're gonna still split on rafters and nothing's gonna have to get pulled off layout. No, nothing needs to get added, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, there it is all framed up. They land into hangers at that five and a half by 15. Ceiling joists extend out to the front of the garage. There's the overframe. Hey, we got our sunny weather. We actually sheeted the whole roof in sunny weather. Uh, that'll be in the next video. Now you can see how it all fits together. We land the roof on top of the sheathing. There's the master bedroom hip tray ceiling, two by 12 sleeper because it allows us to put more nails in and that's what our engineer likes. Can we be honest? That is a thing of beauty. There's just something about stick framing. Thank you all for watching very much. I really do appreciate it. Uh, oh, by the way, there's how the vent block detail works at the ridge. Nice straight line. Forget how long was this? 52 feet long in round numbers? I don't know. Thank you guys for watching. Please hit that subscribe button, thumbs up. We'll see you in the next video. Or I guess you'll see us. Introducing the Beam Wrench 3.0. Have you ever met a beam that you couldn't roll? Me neither. But as I get older, it's important to use my brain more than my giant biceps. So for 10 minutes and $500 in Advantech, you could have a Beam Wrench, or you could order it for me for three easy installments of $943 plus shipping. It comes in Imperial and Metric, which let's be honest, they're the same thing.
Beam wrench. Seriously, it's that heavy? Yeah, it's pretty heavy. This video is sponsored by Huber Engineered Woods, the makers of Advantech subfloor and zip system sheathing. So in this video, we're gonna get into the roof sheathing and also the overframing. So what I just did there is I ripped a 22 foot, 11 inch sleeper valley. You'll see what that means in just a moment. But we decided to start beveling our valleys the way that Ben Morton does. I mean, I don't wanna brag or anything. So I won't, cause that's gauche. Come on. There we go. Hey, I say that's straight. Straight as the sun. Hey, that's only like a $600 piece of wood. Nice. Yeah, so Ben said, he's like, you know, for five minutes worth of work, it's worth it. It actually is five minutes more. It takes that long to cut. How many of you guys pre-cut your roof sheathing? I tend not to pre-cut the cross-cut pieces at each end of a roof, but I do like to pre-cut on the ground, especially with the track saw, any of our rips. I, it goes a lot faster on the ground than it does up on the roof, and then you don't get sawdust all over the roof. So we aim for rips that are no smaller than 24 inches, and we try to balance all of this out to minimize waste. I don't think that a track saw is a necessary tool for a framer, but I do find that in the last three years that we've had it, it's making things go much quicker and cleaner, D depending, obviously, right? It's like every tool, you can waste time with a tool too, you just have to know when to use it. This is one of those times where I feel like it's a huge time savings. Now, I'm stacking all of our rips on the left there next to the windows. We end up using all of those scraps later to pack out our LP trim, which only comes in five quarter width. So again, we're just trying to manage scrap as best we can, especially because summer of 2021, lumber prices were insane. wants to cut some California jacks. At least that's what we call them. These are the jacks that go from the ridge to an overframed valley or California valley. That's what we call them on the west coast of the United States. All two by six here. So what I like to do is I have identical numbers for both sides of the ridge. I cut one batch, plumb cuts on my right and then seat cuts on my left. I crown all the boards the same direction. I use stock that is long enough that I can get my longest jack and my shortest jack. And that way I only have to make one compound miter, which is that cut that I'm about to make. So C cut, set your saw to the tilt of the roof that you're landing on. By the way, this was an irregular roof. So 712 gable landing on a 512 roof. So 712 plumb and C cut, but your saw is beveled to the roof you're landing on, which is a 512 or about 22 and a half degrees. Who makes the square you're using? Well, Martinez Tools makes the square. However, they're discontinued. He doesn't make them anymore. Uh, he only made a few of them. I hurried up and bought one.
this depth adjustment is getting a little sticky, so I just need to spray a little bit of lube in there. I prefer to plumb cut my seat cuts. They're compound miters. Uh, 712 seat cut's not that long on two by six, but still, with the base plate loose, I can essentially plunge in right along that line. I don't know, for me, it's, there's just less binding, it's a little simpler. When I have to cut a bunch of overframe jacks, I like to put as many two by sixes on the saw or whatever the stock is on the saw horses crowned away from me. All plumb cuts go on the right. That way, when I pull a number, it's to the sharp, to sharp, to sharp. That's what we always call it. So it is the long point of your seat cut, which is also the long point of your bevel cut. And since I'm hooking the long point of the plumb cut, sharp, to sharp, to sharp, to sharp. That's just how we do it. So this way, I'm cutting to the sharp of the bevel, which is easier for me to cut since I'm right-handed the way that I'm doing it, as you can see. Then I take all of those boards and I stack them longest to shortest, and that's one side of the roof. In this case, I needed three more, so I grabbed some, I think, 20s or 16s out of the garage. And it's going to look like there's a ton of waste here because I'm only going to cut my three smallest jacks. Then the remaining scrap, I just flip over and I already have the opposite side, sharp and sharp, so I'm gonna hook that and then measure to the long or the sharp of the plumb cut. So everything is sharp to sharp to sharp to sharp, but I'm only making one compound miter cut and essentially getting two rafters out of it. And I'm also cutting the crowns out of the boards to some degree. I've already culled them so that they're not super ugly, but this just kind of contributes to a flat roof. So that was one side of the roof. All of those jacks from longest to shortest are cut. They're stacked from longest to shortest. Now I'm gonna take all the cutoffs, flip them over, and all I have to do is hook the long point and measure to the long point of the plumb cut. So that's what I'm doing here. And I'm working through my list. They're all identical on both sides of the roof. You can see the video above. That's going to take you through the whole process on how do you figure out all the angles, calculate your valley sleepers, and the jacks. So getting two jacks out of a 20 foot two by six leaves me with about, well, I think maybe about 16 inches of scrap if you measure from the long point. Not too shabby. It's all about scrap management. Oh man, those scraps, cause summer of 2021, Lumber prices nearly quadrupled from the year before. <laughs> so that's that 16 inch scrap cost the same as a four foot stick the year before. Oh my goodness, I just can't even believe what lumber prices did. Oh, let's see here. You did.
Here's a pro tip for calculating jacks, but seriously, go check out the video. It goes through all the math. The pro tip is I always start with a 12 inch jack, as you can see, because the heel of the plum cut and the heel of the C cut, they don't really touch. It's just big enough, it doesn't split out. And then I calculate from there until I get to the length of a common rafter. Done, are you still going? I'm in. So I sent the drone up to just get some footage of the last part of the roof being sheathed, primarily to show our fall protection system. Yes, we use fall protection even on a 512. It's only a one-story house, but here in Washington State, anything above four foot when you're on a platform bigger than 45 by 45 requires some form of fall protection. Up on the roof, a lifeline and harness is just the easiest way for us to do that. We typically only work in fall restraint. And what that means is we lead out enough rope that we can't go over the edge at the eaves. Especially on a one-story house wearing a decelerator, you would hit the ground. Once you work in fall restraint, then you kind of can forget about the rope itself. You can just focus on not tripping over it. And yes, I know, well, people feel less safe because they're gonna trip on a rope. Well, the fact of the matter is you're not gonna fall off the roof. So you trip and fall, it's not a big deal because you're not going off the edge of the eaves. We stay in fall restraint, lead out just enough rope to get to the eave, maybe plus one foot. But then once you get farther up the roof, go ahead and choke up on that rope. And now you don't even have to worry about it at all. You're safe, you can just worry about sheeting. And yes, watch where you put your feet. You might be wondering, why are you taping the seams on that sheathing? So this is the Zip System Sheathing. And again, this video is sponsored by Huber Engineered Woods, the makers of Zip System Sheathing. So we use this sheathing on the walls and the roof. The roof is half inch and it's sienna colored. And the reason why we tape it is that dries us in. So the red facing or the green facing on the walls basically takes the place of your weather resistive barrier or your roofing underlayment, depending on your local codes, of course. So once we tape the seams, we are now dried in with the exception of the ridge, because that's gonna get ridge vent. But we are now dried in, and the roofing is applied directly to this. I'll put a link in the description. So I'm taping the valley. I like to use six inch uh, tape in the valley, and what I do is I measure three inches off and snap a line to keep the tape straight. And for me, it just makes it a little easier to work the tape. It's fully adhered, make sure that you roll the tape. The acrylic adhesive is pressure sensitive or pressure activated. Anyway, you can look it up. It definitely holds better when you roll it. If you don't believe me, go do a test. Put two pieces on a wall, roll one, don't roll the other, and come back a week later and you're gonna see how much better one holds over the other. So that's what I'm doing here. Last step, I'm done. Now it's ready for the roofers. So here is the time lapse of the 712 garage gable, it's basically a double gable, almost a triple gable, double gable 712 landing on the 512. So I'm not gonna get into all of this in this video. Go check out how to calculate an overframe and that's where we get into all of the math. Two by 12 sleepers because that's what our engineer requires. It allows for more nails into the roof below, fully sheathed under the overframe for uh, seismic reasons. Basically what that does is it carries the roof diaphragm loads down through the shear walls. So the big advantage of pre-cutting, the valleys were pre-cut, remember we saw the bevel, the commons were pre-cut for the little gable and the one that we're currently working on, and all of the jacks are pre-cut. It saves a lot of time cutting this on the ground.
Before we can sheet this section of roof, of course, I need to put in a couple of lookouts, hang the fly rafters, barge, varge, whatever you want to call them. We call them fly rafters. When it comes to these roofs, this is just my personal preference is to start at the top so that that first longest row is parallel with the ridge. I just find it works a little easier working downhill. It also means that when Kyle's cutting, he can measure essentially all of the valley pieces to the sharp. And, and it's not like it's a big deal, but I just find that it's a little easier. I kind of just get into a rhythm. So put the next row on and the row below it, use up your scrap as you go. Now I have a reference point for this sheet that needs to cut around those fly rafters and land on the ridge below. Is it a big deal? No. Can every framer measure those pieces accurately? Yes. I just try to idiot proof where I can. Last thing we do, of course, tape all the seams, roll all of that tape, tape the valley, and then get, then get off of that roof. We're about done. We actually finished the opposite side. Actually, I finished the opposite side by myself the next morning because Kyle had an appointment and I was leaving for vacation. So it's not just the seams that we're taping. It's also like the plumbing boots, any roof penetrations that we can. And in this case, it's a skylight. So I start at the bottom. And I use that little blue tool, which is a quick flash. If you just Google quick flash, it makes it really easy to get those inside corners. And then of course, don't forget to roll your tape. So bottom piece on first, then I like to stretch tape the corners, then the sides, then the top, and then I stretch tape those corners. It doesn't technically matter because the tape sticks to itself, but if it's easy to shingle from the bottom up, shingle from the bottom up. Sometimes we can't for various reasons when it comes to detailing, but most of the time we can. This stretch tape stuff is pretty cool. It's hard to see here because of the angle of the sun. And when I tried to brighten the shadows in post-production, it just it made it look like some kind of weird cartoon. You'll see it when I come around to the top. And then when we get to the siding video, I'll show it how we flash our windows. This stuff is ridiculously sticky. This was about four o'clock after work and it was hot out. And there was times I edited it out not to bore you guys, but there was times when I just sat there with my heart racing because it was hot. And then when the tape gets hot, it sticks to itself really easily. So this may or may not, but definitely did take a couple of takes to actually get it to be somewhat seamless. Pun intended, pun intended. I used six inch tape all the way around, and that way I got about three inches up the curbing and about three inches on the deck. Personally, I don't think it matters in whatever tape you have, but what we like about this is now we know that the curbing is sealed to the roof deck. When the roofers come back and, and they do their step flashing and all that good stuff, we just have one more added layer of insurance and protection. Uh, we build these houses as spec homes, and we're in this community. We've been in this community since 2000, off and on, and we're gonna be here for at least another decade. So the, we're gonna find out if there's callbacks, people are gonna call us. So let's just get it right, even with, if it's a little bit redundant. By the way, there's the stretch tape and this stuff is stretchy. Okay, here is our preferred fall protection. Strap around the ridge with a chafe guard. My lifeline has a snap hook that snaps around that anchor. I'm connected to the rope by the Prusik rope grab, which is then connected to my shock absorber, 
by this uh, carabiner. So here's how the Prusik knot works. Hand underneath, slides up, opposite to slide down. Once I have the desired length, just let go. That would be fall restraint, by the way. I can't go anywhere. But you see how the, how the knot grabs. Easy to use, fast, super light, no metal parts banging around in the middle of my back. Once that rope is set up, we just leave it there. Who knows who needs to be back up here. Now I'm disconnected. Of course, the ladder's connected. and the obligatory drone shots at the end of, I think, pretty much all my videos. This was before the front overframes went on. So now you can kind of see the body of the main roof landed over the top of the back roof. That's all taped, that's all done. And then we overframe. Again, that's for structural reasons. Our engineer prefers that that roof sheathing on the front or the left side, it basically goes from the plates to the ridge. And then we're gonna land the overframe on top of that very strong in an earthquake and hurricane winds, which thankfully we don't have. We have just lots of rain and the potential for the big one, the big earthquake. And the obligatory shot at the end, the roof is done. Well, not technically. We had to scrounge up some sheets for the back of the garage. Kyle took care of that because I was heading on vacation. Nice hot day. So there's a shot of the nice straight line for the valley tape. And then you can see the air venting for the ridge vent on that front garage roof. Hey, I wanna thank everybody for following along in the series. We got one, maybe two more videos to go. We'll get into siding next time. And yes, if you follow Awesome Framers, we do this on every single house. Take care, everybody, stay safe. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.